Senator Merkley, thank you for joining us. First of all, have you gotten any sleep yet? Yes, I managed to get about 90 minutes of sleep, drank a couple cups of coffee, ate a sandwich, and I'm, and I'm doing much better now. And you're able to speak still. That's amazing. Well, we'll see. We'll see if I'm able to uh, answer anything complicated. Well, you spoke for 15 and a half hours, although it wasn't technically a filibuster because you couldn't block Neil Gorsuch's nomination. Why did you decide to do this? What was the point of it all? It's how significant this issue is. The Supreme Court weighs in and on every issue from labor rights, environmental issues, issues of commerce, a whole host of, of health care uh, issues, uh, transportation, is everything that we do in America, the Supreme Court has a say in. And right now we are on the verge, just uh, two days away from a very tragic event. My Republican colleagues are driving the, the Senate train off a cliff and they've got the Supreme Court in tow and th it's damage that is not easily rectified. In fact, it will probably haunt us for a generation to come. Senator McConnell, the majority leader, has said that Neil Gorsuch will be confirmed by the end of this week, no matter what, and he appears ready to use the so-called nuclear option that would change the Senate rules to just a simple majority vote rather than a 60 votes as required by Senate rules now. It doesn't look like there's any way that the Democrats can block the confirmation. So is it worth it, Senator, to go for this rule change to let the Republicans have this nuclear option that could potentially change the rules forever? Well, no rule in the Senate uh, can necessarily be changed forever. Uh, things can be uh, changed back. They can be modified in all sorts of ways. But is it worth it? Yes, because realize what's at stake here. This is the first time in U.S. history that a seat has been stolen from one president and delivered to another in an effort to pack the court. So if it succeeds, it delegitimizes the decisions of the court. There's going to be a huge number of 5-4 decisions. And with every such decision in which Neil Gorsuch is in the majority, it will lack the, the sense of legitimacy. And so we have to stop this theft before it's completed. We're appealing to our colleagues across the aisle to say, care about the institution, put the brakes on the, on the, on the train, and let's figure out a way to, uh, to uh, prevent this from happening. Senator, in 2013, you supported a change to Senate rules to end what you called the endless abuse of the filibuster for a President Obama's federal judge nominations. And you told the Huffington Post at that time you would stand firm on your desire for a simple majority, even if Republicans control the Senate and the White House like they do now. That has critics calling you a hypocrite. Why have you changed your tune now? Well, actually, I haven't. I'm advocating for the same thing. I argued that we should have a simple majority on the courts at the district level and at the circuit level on the executive nominations. We're now in a Republican administration. I still support both of those items. You can't allow the minority to try to basically destroy a, the presidency of another party. And so uh, we did the right thing. It makes it much easier for Trump to put people into his administration. It uh, makes it easier for him to put people into the lower courts. And that is the way it should be because what happened were two years in which the Republicans, when they were in the minority, were using it, the advice and consent as a tool to just bludgeon the executive and to bludgeon the, the judicial. And you can't let that happen. But we left in place a supermajority on the Supreme Court because it is the final decider. And in that sense, requiring 60 votes to close debate sends a message to the president. Don't nominate, name, not, don't nominate people from the extremes uh, because it reduces the legitimacy of the court. Unfortunately, what Trump did is he nominated someone from the very extreme. The analysis by Washington Post and the New York Times find him to the right of anybody currently serving. He twists the law, tortures the law on decision after decision to find for corporations, and often it's a minority position. And he's criticized by the other folks on the Tenth Circuit who are often been Republican appointees as well. It's just a, it's just a case of government by and for the powerful rather than the vision in our Constitution of government of, by, and for the people. So uh, unfortunately, Trump did that. There's really three reasons we have to stop this nomination. Uh, one is that it's a stolen seat, and so you do great damage. The second is there is an investigation into Team Trump for potential collaboration 
with the Russians to interfere in the election and change the outcome of the election. If that proves to be the case, that is a treasonous act and must be pursued to the full extent of the law. And so that is a dark cloud hanging over this president, and that needs to be removed before he's allowed to put someone on the Supreme Court. And third, Neil Gorsuch is completely outside the mainstream of judicial thought. You have called this a stolen seat uh, from President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland. Did you fight, did the Democrats fight, did President Obama fight hard enough for Merrick Garland? You know, as you look back, everything we did last year, probably we would have fought harder if we knew the outcome was going to look like it is now. Uh, I must say we did everything, we pushed hard in all kinds of ways, but we had no lever to force the majority to hold a hearing in the judiciary, to hold a vote in judiciary. We pressed hard enough that a number of my Republican colleagues weighed in publicly and said, you know what, I'm with the Democrats. We should absolutely be holding a debate, we should be holding a hearing, we should be holding a vote. And they often recanted those positions within days because of the pressure brought to bear primarily through the, the uh, Koch brothers fossil fuel cartel that threatened to do primary uh, election opposition to them the next time they're up for, for election. And so uh, you see the, the really the, the hand of the concentration of power through the Citizens United decision and the dark money. And that powerful fossil fuel cartel is absolutely determined to keep the dark money flowing. And that's why they pushed on the Senate majority to steal the seat. And so there is a profound corruption eating away at the foundation of our institutions. And that's why I spoke all night, to draw attention to this and say, I want to do everything I can. I don't want to leave any stone unturned uh, in an effort to uh, take on uh, this corrupting, powerful force that is about to destroy the integrity of the Senate and certainly uh, tear down the, the uh, legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Senator, we did some digging about your speech overnight. Your speech was the eighth longest in Senate history, but actually it wasn't the longest for an Oregon senator. That honor goes to Senator Wayne Morris in 1953. He spoke for 22 hours and 26 minutes. Do you think you might break that record one day? <laughs> I must say I was only about five hours into the speech last night, and I didn't think I could go for another 10 minutes. So the, the fact that I ended up going uh, for uh, 15 and a half hours uh, surprised me. I went from the first moment the floor was available until the, the last moment before the uh, uh, agreed upon uh, schedule and the Republicans had control of the floor. So it took every moment I, I could. But uh, I, think we'll, well, I think we'll leave Wayne Morse uh, alone and, and let him hold that uh, honor for Oregon.